part of Scripture. So let's read the memory text. Um, this is uh, Jesus speaking. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me, he said. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. So this is one of the many times after the resurrection, but before his ascension, that Jesus was meeting with people and basically giving them Bible studies, right? Because nobody wanted to listen to him before the cross. He was trying to teach them all these different things. And, and the, the, the disciples were in one ear and out the other. Those of you who have had children or have at least seen young people or have been young people, you know that is human nature. It goes in one ear and out the other when we don't want to hear it. And that was the people of God before the cross. And so, after the cross, he had to, they were more apt to listen because it's not every day that somebody rises from the dead. <laughs> so he was teaching them about all the different things, all the different prophecies, uh, all the different, you know, what Moses said, what Jeremiah said, Isaiah, and what the, the different psalmist says. Now the lesson brings out an interesting point. It says that the Psalms has been a prayer book and a hymn book for both Jews and Christians. And one of the things that we'll see later on in the lesson is that how did King David use them? What did he write them for? Remember what the purpose was? Or at least what the result was, was it helped to, during the time of David at least, it helped to free Israel from idolatry. Um, so, what is different about the Psalms to you as opposed to other scriptures? Why is it important that we put an entire quarter on the Psalms? Mm -hmm. And they put it in words, uh, it was a psalm or a poem or however they you know, wrote it down. But God didn't hide anything, uh, which in my case, that, you know, that just helps me realize that I'm not the only one that struggled with the same thing. Yeah. Me too. Because if you read the Psalms, it's everything from... I'm on top of the world to this is the worst day of my life right. and everything in between. <laughs> the, the way uh, Mark Lowry put it, he said if they would have had Prozac back then, it would have leveled everything out. <laughs> it, we wouldn't have the up and down. But um, one of the things that's interesting, if you read in the Ellen White comments, if, if you have the app or if you have the companion book to the Sabbath School lesson, um, she quotes the memory verse from the lesson and this is from Selected Messages. And then she also says that we are anxious that all who claim to believe the truth now open before us, that's all of us, and especially those who take the responsibility of teaching the truth, should have a clearer conception themselves of the all-important significance of the themes of the Bible. And that includes the Psalms. Mm -hmm. How many Messianic prophecies are in the Psalms? A lot. A lot. Psalm 22, I think it was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's others. So, the Psalms is God's word, the lesson says, and we need to understand the poetic features. It's a book of poetry. The historical, the theological, and the liturgical, the literary structures of the Psalms. What's interesting about the Bible, and not just the Psalms, but in other prophetic books of the Bible, is it's written in different literary structures. Because you have the book of poetry, but then you have history. And then in like Daniel and Revelation, you have the chiastic structures. And this is a book written thousands of years before any of these terms ever existed. Did you have a thought? Or are you just scratching? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to say, one thing about the Psalms is I like the way David says, you know, you can't hide from God. If I go, you know, he says all these different things. You know, if I go to the depths of hell, you, you'll find me, and that type of thing. It's like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, you can apply the Psalms to the present truth doctrines that we as a church teeth, teach, not teeth. Um, you know, the Psalms teaches us about the state of the dead. 
It teaches us about the end times and all kind of different things. Let's go to Sunday's lesson and let's go over these scriptures at the beginning here. So somebody, let's just pick and choose. Pick whichever one you want to look up and read it, please. I'll be James 5.13. I wanted that one. Oh. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. Who has First Chronicles sixteen seven? And keep in mind as we're reading these, it says, What were the occasions that prompted the writing of some of the Psalms? And when did they use the Psalms? What purposes, what events, things like that? Go ahead. Okay, Nehemiah 12.8. Don't worry about that. Skip, skip the names. Just read the last part. <laughs> okay, Psalm 18.1. Okay. Psalm 30. It's the new International Debbie version. Thank you. How'd you guess? <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 30, verse 1. I got no 92 years. Go ahead. Okay. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. Whatever, okay. Psalm 95, verse 2. Anybody got that one? Psalm 95, verse 2. Sing unto him, sing songs unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. That's 105, but that is one of them. Oh, did I skip one? That's okay. My bad. <laughs> it's okay. Psalm 95, 2. <laughs> Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and joyful noise. Make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. No, that doesn't refer. <laughs> Support each other, right? Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. The Lord. And James 5.13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So what is, uh, there's one theme in here that I see stands out more than any other. What do you think that is? Let's see if, if any of you others noticed it as well. I think it was praise. Praise and thanksgiving, yes. Now that's just one example, but let's also look. This isn't just an Old Testament thing, you know. The old, the, one of the overwhelming cries that I have seen so many times uh, from a lot of Christianity is that the Old Testament no longer matters, or that it's no longer relevant. However, we have a couple of texts here from the New Testament telling us to sing psalms. And what's interesting about um, the last one? What does James say? If you're afflicted, pray. If you're merry, sing psalms. In any situation, the psalms are for any and every situation. Well, now, God's protection. 
well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that it says on Friday's lesson, but we never get that far, so I decided to put it on today's lesson, <laughs> is it says that the Psalms, it consists of 150 Psalms. I just copy and pasted the quote from Friday's lesson and put it on today. So you can find it on Friday's lesson if you turn there. 150 Psalms, different chapters if you want to call it that. Some people don't look at them as chapters, but anyway. It's it's grouped into five books, and it brings out an, uh, an interesting point. It says the five-book division of the Psalms is an early Jewish tradition that parallels the five-book division of the Pentateuch. And this is not just unique to the Psalms either, because um, one of the things I saw a long time ago in another publication, or it may have been a video, um, was that Isaiah has 66 chapters. And the first 39 chapters of Isaiah parallel the Old Testament. The next 27 parallel the New. So this is not unique to just one book in the Bible. So it brings out the point that the Psalms are composed for use in private and in collective communal worship. They were sung in the temples. Or not temples, there was only one. They were sung as hymns in the temple. There may have been musical instruments. There may have been a cappella. Um, there are some, such as in Psalm 61, it says, that mention musical instruments. Um, Psalm 9, Psalm 8. Uh, and it says that the word psalm means, means what? It means praise. That's, that is its main purpose. Now, how do we reconcile the fact that the psalms means praise, but so many of the psalms are like, this is the worst day of my life. God, do something. Smite my enemies. Bash their head in. I mean, let's be honest, some of the Psalms are about that graphic. So how do we reconcile the meaning of the name of Psalms with some of its darker chapters, I guess, for lack of a better phrase? I like the way Paul puts it to um, rejoice in all things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, rejoice in all things. Yeah. And it points out that God can do anything. Yeah. Amen. So in spite of, of um, and James chapter 1 brings out the same point as well. Paul says it, but James also says what Debbie was saying. Is that count it all joy when you come into trials. It doesn't say we have to praise God for the trials. Yeah. We don't have to praise God for the dementia or the cancer or bad things happening. But we do need to praise God in, in spite of them. But um, and pray for others. If you're, for example, the way James writes, afflicted, you should pray for others because by praying for others that may be going through the same thing, mm -hmm. you may be healed. Yeah, yeah, Which exactly. Really bizarre in a sense, but and using the scriptures in those prayers is vital because they are God's communication to us. Yeah. Now, um. When you read the different psalms and you see, like Psalm 38, for example, I think it's Psalm 38. You, you guys can turn to that one later uh, if you like. But that is the one, if I remember right, that's the psalm where there, there's nothing joyful about it. There's no positives mentioned. There's no praises mentioned. There's no thanksgiving mentioned. It's all just darkness, right? I'm sick. I'm, my life totally bites. Um, you know, it's just not a good situation. But the theme that you see is that even though the psalmists wrote these experiences, that they still never gave up their trust in God. Mm -hmm. That was the key. So, um, one of the things that the lesson points out is that the psalms did not only accompany the people's worship back then, but they also told them how to worship in God's sanctuary. Um, what was the difference, what were some differences between how Israel was commanded to worship in the sanctuary of God and how the surrounding nations worshipped their gods? Do you remember any of those? Um, what did you say? I'm sorry. So the Psalms tells us how to, uh, tells us, accompanies worship, but also tells us how to worship in the sanctuary. Now, Speaking of ancient Israel, and you could even apply this to modern Christianity, what's the difference between how they worshipped God in the temple, how the Bible commands us to worship God, 
and how the ancient surrounding nations, the different pagan nations, worshipped their gods. Mm-hmm. Human. And then, um, like if we look at, like, I always think of Elijah and Elisha when he's up on Mount Carmel. Elijah. Um, and how they were trying to contact their gods, mm-hmm. the Baal. Baal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know they were cutting themselves, hurting themselves, and that's one thing that God never asks us to do is to hurt to, to mutilate ourselves. Yeah. So you had these in particular interest in... What am I trying? I'm stumbling over my words. I'm sorry. Um, You had these different practices. Like, sacrifices weren't unique to just the pagans. Israel did sacrifices as well, but the difference was, like, the human sacrifices. Or I think it was Antiochus Epiphanes brought a pig into the Jewish temple because he knew that would desecrate it. Um, You know, there were all these different things. Some other things, but what are some other things? I know there's other things they did back then. Multiple, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, Christians, it, the Israelites, um, had the one and only God mm-hmm. that they worshipped and served. But, you know, the pagans just had a God for this and that. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the main, probably downfall was the human sacrifice. Yeah. You had and gods. Idols, too. Like, like yeah. The Bible tells us that the Gentiles, the heathen, would worship under anything, anywhere. They just build on a little altar mm-hmm. and they would worship. Even Abraham went and built little altars along the yeah, way. Before there was a temple. God, yeah. And the heathens came and took them over and sacrificed to their own gods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There were lots of different things. There was you had Moloch who demanded child sacrifices, you had Ashtaroth. You had Baal, a um, whole lot of others. The Egyptian gods, Ra, uh, Anubis, all those different ones. And <laughs> Israel was even received judgments from God in, when they were in the desert because they went to worship uh, the Moab, was it the Moabites or the Midianites gods with, with the, the different sexual festivities, right? Mm. There were the temple prostitutes, things like that. So you had all these different manner of of pagan worship services, some more questionable, some less questionable, but all not good. Um, and God even commanded Israel in Deuteronomy, he says, don't go worship me the way that the pagans worship their gods. Don't go, let me see how they worship their god. Let me go see how the Catholics worship their gods. Right? Don't worship God like that, he says. Let me go see how the Buddhists worship their gods. He said, don't do that. Because you will be corrupted. And so... You see these themes in the Psalms to, to approach God with awe and reverence. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to what? The rock that is higher than I, right? It's, it's a cry for help. It's, it's an admission that you can't do it, right? Um, so... It says in the Sabbath school lesson, um, the Egyptian Hallel, which was the certain psalms that were sung at the different uh, three major annual festi- f- f- uh, festivals, sorry, um, such as Passover, um, and they were incorporated into the daily prayers, and they were to commemorate. Um, how God had freed them from ancient Israel. I think Psalm 118 is one of those. Um, Psalm 113 to 118, yes. So the Psalms then are also used to commemorate how God has rescued you from whatever struggle it is you have been in. So have you ever, as a way to thank God, have you ever sat down and, and read the Psalms or sang the Psalms or even written your own as a way to say thank you, God? If you haven't, I definitely encourage you to. Not everybody's a writer, but everybody can read the Psalms. Um, we've, been, we've read the Psalms more than a few times, but I mean, I, I love to go back and, and reread them. We will. Yeah. When 
I was a child, they they had us memorize Psalm 100. Psalm 100? Mm-hmm. Which one is that one? Is it? Make a joyful noise oh. the Lord, all you lands. Make a joyful noise. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to sing. Well, it says all. Right. All you lands. That means everyone. Mm-hmm. Because God has been good to all of us, regardless of how we've been good to Him or not. Wow. He had the whole thing memorized? That's impressive. That's a long book. Like I knew some I didn't know them, but I I heard a sermon of somebody who had memorized uh, the book of Mark. I think it was David Koresh memorized either the Old Testament or the whole Bible. It was insane. But he obviously didn't use it for the for the right purpose, of course, but you know, it shows it's possible. <laughs> Uh, the um, Ellen White comments again. Does anybody have that book or the lust the app? I know you have the app, but if you don't have the official GC app for the Sabbath School lesson, definitely download it onto your phone because it includes the Ellen White comments um, that that are, that you can also find in the companion book. And one of the quotes is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume Five, and it says, "There is too much formality in our religious services." says, the Lord would have his ministers who preach the word energized by his Holy Spirit. It doesn't necessarily mean like the Lord, in, in the beginning, the, the Lord created the heavens and the earth. That, that's not what we're supposed to do, is it? You know, be happy. You know, don't, don't stand up there and, and, and look depressed. Be happy. It says, um, the people who hear should not sit in drowsy indifference or stare vacantly about making no responses to what is said. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times that I have been up front preaching and I have seen people sleeping through the service. I had one guy. Sleeping. Sleeping. <laughs> Anybody who's been up there has seen it at some point. I, I remember... Um, I'd rather them sleeping in the pew than back there behind me. That's, that's true. That's fair. No, I, I saw one guy when I was preaching in Illinois one time. One of the elders. I mean, yeah, he was out. He was... And he come up to me after the service, and he goes, beautiful message. I'm just like, you were, like, I didn't say it, but I'm like, you were sleeping, dude, come on. But anyway. You should have said, what, what, what's your favorite part? Right. <laughs> right. Don't sleep during service. I mean, this is one of the most important parts of the week. This is the most important day of the week. Uh, Lenora? I was just going to tell about uh, this man that he came from Shreveport that Ellen White had dedicated him. Oh, wow. In Keene? California. California. And he saw Sister White. He said he had to get up early to attend to the boarders. And so on his way, he passed Sister White's house. Mm -hmm. And one morning he passed, and he saw her at her desk, and she was looking up, and he said an angel was there. He's trying to get that story. That's cool. But he was he was telling about you know his childhood and stuff. But before he started, he said, "If I catch anyone sleeping, I'm going to throw the hymnal out." <laughs> okay. And this one guy was sleeping, and he did. He threw the hymnal. Oh no! Oh my word! It was right here in this church. And I had a member in Minton years ago, Texarkana, uh-huh. make me a deacon stick. You ever seen a deacon stick? It's got a feather on one end, tickle the ladies that are sleeping, and a, and a, uh, a mallet on the other end to watch the men that are sleeping. That's funny. And a deacon. Apparently, this is true. My Mainly dad Baptist said that that's churches. what the deacons did. The kids had to set up the first couple of rows, <laughs> and if they misbehaved, that's what the deacon did. <laughs> yeah. But you know, she goes on to say there should be wide awake active churches to encourage and uphold the ministers of Christ. Help him. He can't do this alone. 
and to aid them in the work of saving souls. Where the church is walking in the light, there will be cheerful, hearty responses and words of joyful praise. Have you ever heard the phrase, the frozen chosen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it, some people might do it too much, but some people don't do it enough. If you agree with something, say amen. amen. And you don't have to be like all up, you know, we don't have to be Pentecostals, right? And that's not to say anything about them. But support what you agree with. Support the truth that is being taught. And say amen in the right places. Yeah. There was a lady in Shreveport, and this is her amen. Amen. Oh, no. Amen. And she would amen in the wrong places. <laughs> I want to say, I didn't need an amen then. <laughs> that, that would just be inconvenient at the wrong spot, yeah. One of the important things she goes on to say is, let us learn the song of the angels now. If we don't learn it now, we're not going to be singing it there. And uh, one more from this particular series of quotes. It says, there are few means more effective for fixing God's words in the memory than repeating them in song. Um, there are, and, and now it's easier than ever because you can go to YouTube or other music streaming services, and there are tons of scripture songs that you can listen to for free. Um, there's an app called Scripture Singer. You can look up that. I can't remember if it's on Android or iPhone or both, but um, look up that one too. Uh, there, there's all kind of different ways, and if a song doesn't do it, then look up other ways. We have the internet to research what ways that are better for you to memorize. And she goes on to say, such song has wonderful power. Song has power to subdue rude and uncultivated natures. How many times have you been angry and just in a bad mood, but you started singing and it completely changed your perspective? That was me on Thursday. I just was not in the, the greatest mood. I'm like, you know what, Lord, I'm going to sing anyway. And by the end of the day, I was good. Amen. It, ha <laughs> it's, it has power. It has power to change your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. It has power to banish gloom and depression and all of that and that's not to diminish those who struggle with mental health problems I'm one of those right but it helps so much more than we recognize and she goes on to say singing is as much an act of worship as is prayer indeed many a song is prayer and that's why I, I think that's why I liked the the um, when we when we did the inspirations here we would come here every chance we got because we just we really enjoyed that concept, that 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 kind of service. Um, Monday's lesson is about meeting the psalmists. So there are different psalmists. A lot of people that well, David wrote the psalms, and eh, some of them, part of them. He wrote more of the psalms than I think anybody else did. But it's either just under half or just over half. I can't remember. Um, I want to say just under half. But David was one of them. Uh, you also had uh, Asaph, um, sons of Korah, somebody named Heman the Ezraite. I had never seen that name before, so I guess I need to read the Psalms more. <laughs> Ethan the Ezraite, Solomon wrote a couple, Moses wrote a couple, and then there's probably several um, anonymous ones as well. Uh, you know, for example, we don't know who wrote the book of Ruth, I don't think. So there, there, there could very well be some Psalms that we just don't know. So there's a few more scriptures that I want to look at. Um, so on Monday's lesson, if you guys will just pick and choose one, I'll read the first one, Psalm 25, because it's a longer one, and that'll give everybody a chance to look up the other ones. So the question to keep in mind is, what do these psalms reveal about the experiences that their authors were going through? So I'm going to read the first one, Psalm 25. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Do you remember that song, sweetheart? Yes, I was going to say, how are we able to read it and not sing it? Because I don't sing in public much. He said, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Paths is the way that we live our lives. Lead me in thy truth. Teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long. So somebody has Psalm 42, verse 1? I have the last one, so when you get to the last one, I'm ready. Okay. I got Psalm 84. Who's got 42? Lenora? I have it. As 
the deer pants for the water brooks. So pants my soul for you, O God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and, be, and appear before God? Is this the one, As the Deer? Yeah, that's As the Deer. That's the one that that song's... Have you guys heard that song, As the Deer? I grew up on that song. Yeah. Psalm 75. Should we get you some hand warmers, Debbie? I've got gloves and think that would help. Anyway. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. Psalm 77. Anybody have that? I'll read it if not. I do. Okay. I, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. 84 verses 1 and 2. I got it. This is a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see Drew. <laughs> My soul longs, yes, even thanks for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now let me pause for a second and ask you a question. When was the last time you were like, I can't wait to get to the Atlanta church? <laughs> well, how many of us have that attitude, though? We go through the week, Sunday through Friday, and the Sabbath isn't even in our minds. It's just, but we, you know... This really should be our attitude. I cannot wait to get to be with my church family. Mm -hmm. Anybody got Psalm 88, 1 to 3? Go ahead. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws nigh unto the grave. And 89. Miss Kathy? Yes, sir. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. So here in this group of scriptures, we have that spectrum. This is the greatest day of my life. This is the worst day of my life. By the way, the one that Kathy read, mm -hmm. that was by the e Ethan, the... Ethan, okay, the Ezraite. Ezraite. If I'm, I'm butch probably butchering that, that ite name, but hey. But um, Brandy just read, you know, obviously I can see the... Fair, but when he said, telling, um, praying to the Lord, saying, incline thine ear to hear my cry. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm the only one in trouble here, but just, you know, help me. Yeah. Basically. And I think one of the important things that this group, the, all the Psalms in general, but this group here is showing us is that, you know, it's easy to praise God when things are going great. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so easy when everything is going wrong. And so, but we see the situation where we need to pray to God and to praise Him in each of these situations. Because in Psalm 88, the first thing He says does not, He says, is not, my life sucks. The first thing He says is, God is awesome. God is my salvation. Yeah. And then He goes into, well, I need help. So you have all these different themes. You have prayer for intercessory prayer. We need that for each other. We need to pray for Rhonda's brother, right? Yeah. Especially. Um, praise. Answered prayer. Uh, worship. Psalms about oppression. How many psalms did David write where he was being hunted by Saul? When he was going through oppression. And even when he was being hunted by his own son, Absalom. So the lesson brings out that the Holy Spirit inspired these psalms and used these authors' talents in service to God and their community of faith. So if God has gifted you with something, He wants you to use it to help everybody else here out. You're, you're not an island. You're not alone. You're not, you aren't, your life is not to serve self. You know, Most people in the world choose to serve self, but if you're going to be a Christian, we're here for each other. It's not about me. It's about us. The psalmists were people of genuine devotion and profound faith, and yet prone to discouragements and temptations, as are the rest of us. This is what makes the psalms so powerful, I think. 
It's because whatever you're going through, Debbie or, or Dennis or Lenora or whoever, there's a psalm for it. Did you just win the lottery? There's a psalm you can praise God for, it, although we really shouldn't be playing the lottery. You know, did somebody die? There's psalms for that. Did you lose everything? There's psalms for that. Are you being persecuted at work? There's psalms for that. Did I put my feet on you? Do you remember that oh. <laughs> okay. That one requires an explanation. Yeah. Um, quite quite a few years ago, I was we were at his sister's house, and I was laying on the floor, and he was sitting on the couch, and he put his feet on me, and I said, "Hey, that's not nice." And he's like, "What do you mean? What did I do?" And I said, "You know, the Bible says I will make." my enemies your footstool and I'm just like you're calling me an enemy of God that's not nice <laughs> that's our cheesy humor for you <laughs> but you know the the lesson also brings out in addition to all of that when we read Psalm 88 verses 2 and 3 where it says let my prayer come before you incline your ear to my cry for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. It says that this is the cry of a 20 century, 21st century soul as much as it was from somebody 3,000 years ago when it was written. Some psalms focus on um, joys. Some focus on hardships. But all of them focus on God. And all of them show how God gives us His, his undeserved favor. They, they glorified God, he, it says, for his faithfulness and his love. Even, even in the hard times, they recognized his goodness. It says, the Psalms are, thus, testimonies of divine redemption and signs of God's grace and hope. They convey a divine promise to all who embrace by faith God's gifts of forgiveness and of a new life. Yet, at the same time, this is, this is key here. At the same time, they do not try to cover up, hide, or downplay the hardships and suffering prevalent in a fallen world. Have you ever been in a situation where you just wanted somebody to recognize what you were going through? You didn't necessarily want a solution. You just wanted them to recognize your situation was hard, and you wanted your feelings to be validated. Right. That's what the Psalms does. That's what God is doing for us in the Psalms. He's saying, I know your life is hard. And I recognize that, and your feelings are valid. And here's the solution. How many times in the Bible do we read stories of how God's people had come up to these different hard situations, and God, all God commanded them to do was to focus on Him and praise Him during that time? Remember the story when Israel was fighting, I think it was the Ammonites? Maybe been someone else. But what what... <laughs> What they did was Moses lifted his hands up to heaven. That, that, was, that was how they won the war. God honored that as an act of worship and gave, gave them the victory. One of my favorite stories of this concept is in Second Chronicles 20, chapter 20. And when this massive army was coming up against Israel, what did they do? They kind of freaked out, Right? They, 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 they went to God, but they were freaking out in the process because imagine the entire state of Texas coming to battle with this church. I mean, how many of us would be confident of victory? That's kind of the concept here. And what did God command them to do? Sacrifice 15 animals? Go to church on Sabbath? That's important. What did He command them to do in Second Chronicles 20? You remember the story? To sing praises. Form a choir, he said. Didn't tell them to get their weapons ready. Didn't tell them to organize an army. Organize a choir and sing praises. And through that experience, God gave them victory in a way that they could not have possibly done for themselves. So the lesson asks the question, how can we draw hope and comfort knowing that even faithful people, such as the ancient psalmists, struggled with some of the same things that we do? How can we draw inspiration from that? Can we draw hope if that's your question? 
Yeah. Because when I look at their, their lives and see that their struggle is the same as mine, they made it through, were forgiven and made it through with God's grace, gives me hope and comfort, peace, knowing God's with me too, and I can do it also through His grace. Yeah. And what's important to recognize is that these Psalms were written in the mindset of humanity. The Bible is not God dictating what to write down. It's God inspiring people. And they wrote it down as they understood it. And so this is a book that we can relate to, right? If there was any experience that, could not, that the Bible could not be used for, then God would then be an unfair God, right? And I think one of the things that the psalm teaches us is that God is our only hope. He will not fail us. However we feel, whether we feel that joy or not, if we focus on Him, that joy will come. Joy will come and go. Happiness will come and go. They're emotions. But focusing on God is what will give us the victory. So, Tuesday's lesson brings out a psalm or a song for every season, it says. So it brings out a few different texts. Some of them, a couple of them are kind of long, but so we'll just summarize. Psalm 3, it starts out, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Many are they that rise up against me. And it goes on to say, to say stuff like that. But it says in verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. What does a shield do? It protects. Now, if we connect this with Ephesians 6, where it says, take up the shield of faith, one of the things that I've learned about that concept, the shield of faith, is that what they would do anciently is that these shields were often made of metal in the shape of a large door. And they were kind of covered in leather sometimes, or at least the edges. And they would take this shield and soak it in water. And uh, then they would go into battle. And that water-soaked shield is how they were able to distinguish, to extinguish those fiery arrows that their enemy shot at them because that was a common thing. You take an arrow, put some kind of pitch or tar on there, light it on fire, and you could do some damage with that. That's how the ancient Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 AD, one of the ways. But when we take that shield of faith, the fact that God is our shield, and, and we soak that in His love, we soak that in the Holy Spirit's power, then when Satan sends all these experiences, these trials, these, these fiery darts at us, they won't work. And it goes on to say, I cried to the Lord with my voice. This is one of those, I had a hard situation, but I trusted God, and He got me out of it. And, and it's not even, and this psalm really doesn't even say that He got, him, got me out of it yet, but it does say that, um, Arise, O Lord, and save me, for mine enemies uh, have, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. The focus is on God without, without even necessarily needing a resolution for the trial. The focus is on God. Uh, Psalm 33 focuses on praising God with different musical instruments. You know, and one of the things that the Psalms shows us is that there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. Um, and then... Uh, Psalm 109 is one of those very interesting ones. Um, verse 9 says, Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. That's, that's, that's one of those, the, the psalmist was having problems with someone. And he's saying, Okay, Lord, give him a wicked man to rule over him. Let Satan pester him. Let him be judged. Let him be condemned. Let if even his prayer become sin. And this is kind of a funny verse right here. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be continually vagabonds. Let them seek their bread out of desolate places. This is harsh. But this is human emotion. And what does this say about us when we're praying? What if we're super angry with somebody? Does that preclude us from prayer? Not necessarily, no. The only thing that will prevent our prayer from being heard is cherishing sin. But if I'm angry with somebody, then who better to talk to than God Himself? And I can't tell you the amount of times I have yelled at God. 
not necessarily because I was angry at God himself, but other people. I'm just like, Lord, this situation is not good. I don't like this person right now. They have, they have really frustrated me, and I don't know what to do. Now, I haven't been so bold as to pray what this psalmist is praying. But um, I, I think it's important that this is in the Bible. So what are some of the things that these different psalms show us, the different human experiences, in your, in your opinion, in your mind? Right. It's not that I need to take it out on God, but I need to give it to God. You know, and, yeah. and express those feelings to Him because He's the only one who can heal those feelings. Yeah, and we see that experience in Moses. God called Moses. Hey, Moses, go to, go to Egypt. No, I don't think so. I don't want to. Moses, go to Egypt. No, send this person instead. You know, there's... The, yeah. The point, you know, in these different situations, whether you agree with God or not, whether you're angry with God or angry with somebody else, talk to Him. He cannot help you if you don't talk. A marriage cannot survive if you don't communicate. You know, marriages that last 50 years, they do so for a reason. So one of the things that the lesson brings out, and I think we only have a few minutes left, um, is that there's different things used in the Psalms. There's praise, uh, we talked about that, thanksgiving, there's laments, there's wisdom, royal Psalms, there's historical Psalms, um, but there's also different uh, concepts that we see played out in the Psalms. It brings out, this is um, Tuesday's lesson, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. And that's kind of falls under this first one is parallelism. Using these different symbols to to say something. God is my refuge. Bless the Lord all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So you have this I'm sorry, God is my refuge would be under the next one. Uh, imagery, sorry. But parallelism would be um all that is within me is the same as saying my soul, praise God. Right? You see this concept all throughout Scripture. The Bible will say one thing, say the same thing in different words just to get the point across. Yeah. And that was just the way the Hebrew mindset worked. So then you have imagery, which uses the figurative language. God is my refuge. God is my rock. Um, I will dwell under the shadow of his wings. So it's just in Psalm 91, Psalm 17. These are things that appeal to our physical senses. One of the things that the Bible does is it appeals to all of the different ways that we learn. And we all learn differently. Now, the third one, it says merism. Does it say that in your lesson? I have the digital one. Mer Those of you who have the hard copy lesson, does it say merism there? Yes. Okay. Because sometimes in the Sabbath school lesson, the apps will mess things up. But apparently it means to express totality. So I cried day and night before thee. Um, kind of like if you've had a trial that seems like it will not end. And then you have wordplay. Um, different words that are used to convey different things and then very similar words, uh, such as it says the Hebrew words for Elohim, for God, is similar sounding to the word for idol, which I'm not going to try and pronounce that because I'm going to butcher it. But... Um, and then, of course, Selah, which is the call to um, pause and reflect. So, kind of, in, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Can somebody read Second Samuel 23, verses 1 and 2? And then somebody read Romans 8, 26 and 27. Okay. Go ahead and read it, that's fine. Somebody read Second Samuel. Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, 
Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. And then verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. So regarding the Psalms and prayer, what do these texts teach us about prayer? The Holy Spirit is a key ingredient here. So what do these, these scriptures teach us about prayer? I think there are a lot of times that when we pray, we don't know exactly what to say. Mm -hmm. We know how we feel, but we don't know how to put it into words. And if we just pour out our heart in the best way we can, the Holy Spirit will translate it. Mm -hmm. And what we are wanting to say will be said. Right. And there's uh, the story of the demoniacs. I remember in Desire of Ages, he talks about how when they came up to Jesus, they were going to open their mouth and beg for help, but then the demons took over, right? But God heard the prayer of their heart, and that was all he needed to do something. And it says, the Spirit spake by me. So the Holy Spirit will take what we, what we know how to say, and, and he'll, he'll do with it what we can't. But also, prayer is inspired by who? By God, by the Holy Spirit. Um, so you see, and you see that all through the Psalms, it says the Psalms assume the dynamics of vivid interactions with God. So this is not a, a frozen chosen situation, right? This is a, well, this isn't any just one situation regarding the Psalms. It's all the range of human experience. And one of the things, and I guess we should probably close here, um, since we're getting to the end. One of the things that is, I think is important to point out is how the lesson says, the Psalms address God personally as my God, my King. Now tell me, why is that important? Even though he says my, he's everyone's mm -hmm. close relationship. That's it right there. Because I can say God so loved the world all without believing that God so loved me. Right. Like, I don't matter. But right. Yeah. How easy it to say, God loves you, Kathy, but I don't think he loves me. I've sinned too much. Have you heard that one before? I'm sure you have as a pastor. Um, I remember reading, I think it was HMS Richards Sr., whichever one was alive during Ellen White's day. Um reading a story about when he saw Ellen White preaching and uh, she was near the end of her sermon and her son I think it was William uh, he, he comes mom you need to calm down you're old you need to take a break she's like hang on I just want to pray for them and she got down and prayed and everybody was kneeling and HMS Richards wrote that he was afraid to open his eyes because he thought he would see God there and that's not the point I wanted to make though he, the point that he said was that the way that she prayed is what touched him. When she started her prayer, she didn't say, you know, Almighty God. She didn't say, Lord Jesus. She says, Oh, my Father. This is a personal message. While this is a gospel that needs to go to the world, this is a very personal message. God is a personal God, and He wants a relationship with each one of us as if we are the only person in the world. Because He died for us knowing for Him, even if just one of us accepted Him, it's enough. So, go through the rest of the lesson. There's still a couple of days. Uh, and then study it for next week. But um, I think there's going to be a lot of good things in this quarter. This lesson was really good. So, shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here and for this lesson and help us to dive into the Psalms and just to see who you are there and to see that all of these Psalms apply to the range of human experience and help us to trust you as they did and to overcome as they did. In your name, amen.